Okay. So what we started the other day was single phase power. Um, and I put in here the summary of basically all the different kind of formulas that you might need to think through. All right. So um, one of the things that uh, always gets everybody confused is whether the loads, when they're inductive, and capacitive, what's that mean? Leading or lagging, right? But that, and there's a whole ton of the formulas here, right? So out of curiosity, if you if you know here, here's my here's my complex power vector that I put up there, right? So if I had a load that had the complex power vector that I showed right here, what kind of load is that? Is that an inductive load or a capacitive load? Inductive. inductive how do you know? because the angle is positive because we're talking about a load that has a has a positive real or sorry positive imaginary part all right so if as pot so the angle of the impedance and the angle of the complex power vector are always the same okay so do i call this leading or lagging lagging. i call this lagging and the way that that always means it's lagging the current is lagging the voltage that's where, where that's where that comes from Okay. And if it's leading, it means the current's leading the voltage. All right. I, for whatever reason, I don't, I always have to think about that one. I don't bother memorizing that. I just, what I know is that if I have an inductor, I have, an, I have a positive imaginary part to my impedance. If I have a capacitor, I have a, I have a negative imaginary part to my impedance. And I can figure out the angles pretty, pretty quick from there. Okay. But that, that's sort of everything that you would kind of need to know with RMS and peak and all that stuff. Okay. But like I said, I'm going to probably fo focus kind of exclusively on using RMS because like the real engineers, if you go to Duke or whatever, you, they're not going to be talking about, you know, a peak value and they're not going to be talking about 377 radians per second, right? You talk in terms of RMS values. And, and so I try to keep everything kind of standard in that way. All right. The other day we did a problem um, in single phase. I basically had these two loads in parallel. And I said that these guys, one of them was, um, one of them I gave you the apparent power. So one thing that's important too, um, is Nick, you came by and asked that question the other day. And I think a lot of people get, get stuck on this. Um, I guess I don't, I didn't call it out here. Maybe I should. S, when I write this S with a bar like this, this is the vector. This is called complex power. That's not apparent power. Apparent power is the magnitude of that thing. Okay. So if, if you're going in and you're trying to enter in the, the apparent, the comp, the apparent power and you put in the vector or you, or if you say the complex power and you do VRMS times IRMS, those, those are not the same thing. The apparent power is, is a number. It's a scalar number and it's the magnitude of that vector. Okay. If you've ever used a UPS, like a UPS uh, for a computer or something like that, you'll always see those are rated in volt amps, VA. Um, and it's very common to rate devices in basically how much voltage and how much current can it give you, okay? Um, so it's it's a pretty common thing to use. But anyway, so we did this the other day. I gave you basically the values of these things. You can go back and look at the recording of it. Um, and we got through all of these steps. Now, the step that I changed a little bit for today, because I wanted to, it actually lines up with problem five on the homework, I think, um, where I said, last time I said, add a capacitor in parallel to the loads to make the power factor unity. That's what I said last time. Um, on the homework, I gave it 0.95 was one of the one of the ones that I gave. So hopefully people know how to do that, but it's it's a pretty similar approach, right? So I want to I want to try that. So basically the other day we got to this point where I said, all right, um, the total apparent power into those loads, S1 plus S2, is this guy right here. So S1 plus S2 is that, okay? Now, if I put a capacitor in parallel with that, the total apparent power is just, I just add them up, okay? Now, if my target is to get to a power factor of 0.95, then this is no longer true. Right, there has to be some J Q that goes to it. Now, how do I figure out what's what's the P total supposed to be? And what's the Q supposed to be? 
if I want the power factor to be 0.95, and I know that right now, before I put the capacitor in there, that's the complex power going to that load. How do I figure this out? So you know that P would stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. So the P, the P is the work that's happening. And I, I don't want to put another load in there to do more work. The P is going to stay the same. So this guy here stays the same. So this is still 21 kW. The Q, I don't know what the Q is, right? But what I know is I want that Q to become not 11.796. All right. First thing I probably got to do is figure out. I didn't write it down, but what what is the power factor of that? Well, um, so let's let's try this real quick. So my current, what do we have? We had eleven, twenty one kilowatts and eleven point seven nine six k vars. So I draw the triangle for that. So where's the P and where's the Q in my triangle? Yeah, yep. P is P is my real axis quantity. Q is my imaginary axis quantity. So here's Q, here's S. Um, and boy, I didn't write this part down. For, for this particular one, uh, I th think the power factor here works out to be um, about 0 0.87. Okay. Something, something like that. About 0 0.87 is the power factor. Now, just as a as a means of understanding that, um, something I probably should have should have mentioned. If you look at if you look at the if you go online, you can Google Duke Duke Energy Carolinas. You can Google their rate structures or whatever. So so the numbers their rate structures. There's a document that says how you pay your electric bill. For an industrial customer, this is probably a no no. They usually want them to be above 0.9. All right, and they will actually bill you if you're this low. So, um, and there's reasons for that. The, the reasons for that really kind of being, if I, if I went back and looked at this problem, there is more power coming out, more P coming out of this voltage source than is needed to provide you the P, you the user, the P that you need, all right, because of this guy. So, so to keep everybody's rates low, Duke basically penalizes people for using too much or too low of a power factor. Okay, that's why we talk about it a lot. Now, I, don't, I won't get into all the details on that, but it's but it's but it's important to usually get it close to one, and it's easy to do it because you can basically put a capacitor in parallel to fix it. All right, so <clears throat> this guy's got a power factor of 0.87. That would be a bad thing. All right, um, this is the 21 kW. This was the, uh, what was it, 11.796 kVar. kVar. Okay. So if I want to fix this, you guys already identified that I can't change the P. That's 21 kW, but I can change the Q, all right? So this guy here, basically what I do is I say, there's a Q target that I wanna hit, all right? And I want this guy such that the Q target gives me this angle so that cosine of phi Z, which is the power factor, is equal to 0 0.95. That's what I wanna have happen. So I wanna figure out, okay, what value of Q do I need to make that happen? Okay. So where should I start? Find out what I need for phi z. Well, so it turns out I don't even need to figure out that. I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable thought. I could just solve this, right? I don't need to know the angle. I, I, so, so you said, so one thing that you just said, you were redundant in that, right? So not to call you out, but so comp, the magnitude of the complex power is the apparent power. Okay, so, it'll just be the apparent so find the apparent power. Yeah. So basically the, the length of this side right here, I can solve for, right? So I could say, and I'll write it that way. I'll try to, that's the apparent power. So the magnitude of S. Basically, I use the P formula. The magnitude of S 
times the cosine of phi z. That's why I don't need to actually know what phi z is. Um, is equal to p, which we know is 21 kW. And because I know that the power factor is 0.95, I can say the magnitude of that s needs to be 21 kilowatts divided by 0.95 or 22 0.105. What units do I give this guy? No, volt amps, KVA. Is there a question in there? Yeah. Um, if we did find phi z and then there's nothing wrong, with, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I shouldn't say that's the wrong way. It's it's a way to go. You could probably do that too. I mean, it's just a triangle. There's a couple of different ways to get there, but it's not the way I did it beforehand. <laughs> so I don't know what phi z is. <laughs> so I, so yeah. So it, there's probably a couple of ways to get there, right? Um. So okay. So I've got that magnitude there, or the apparent power. So what can I do with that? What am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to figure out, remember what the capacitor value needs to be. So the first thing I gotta do is figure out what's the Q need to be. So now, now I know the, I know this side of the triangle. I know this side of the triangle and I know the cosine of the angle. So what do I need to do now to find, how do I find Q? So I say Q target, cause that's basically the combination Q that I wanna get. Uh, could you just use your magnitude and your power factor? Yeah, I could use the magnitude and the power factor. I guess I do need to find phi z. I didn't because I did this quick. So basically, what would I do? I would say if I looked at this Q target, it's the magnitude of S times the sine of phi z. Like that. Yeah, that's what you were thinking, probably. Yeah. You could use Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. I mean, it's it's ugly no matter what. The other thing you could do is, as Moose is saying, is you could say, well, the magnitude of S squared is equal to P squared plus Q squared. So I could do it that way, right? That would work, all right? What, what I did was I did this. And I could say the sine of cos inverse of 0.95 is what I did, like that, all right? It is most, those approaches all work, but I didn't even bother to go through the step of what what was the angle. What I ended up with here was that this this is six point nine zero two four k bar, like that. Okay. Now that didn't solve my problem. Right? I mean, it got me part of the way there. Basically, what I'm saying is this Q target. The Q I'm trying to get to is whatever Q I started with. So that was this 11.976 kVar. Plus what else? Like, how do I get to that Q target? Well, I needed to add a capacitor in parallel, right? So wouldn't it be plus whatever the Q capacitor is? What do I know about a capacitor's Q? Is it positive or negative? negative? Negative, right? So basically that tells me if I just do the math on this, that QC is gonna work out to be negative, I'm gonna write down, four something, 4.8936 kVar, right? That's what I need. Now, I didn't actually solve for the capacitor value because it's the exact same thing that I did last time, right? So what I did last time was I said, well, and I should be careful here probably. I'm talking about the, I'm really trying to talk about this guy in terms of the magnitudes, right? So I put the magnitude of Q, the magnitude of the voltage, and the magnitude of the impedance. I can figure out from this what the magnitude of the impedance needs to be and then drop it over there to find the capacitor value, okay? So it's a, it, it's a process, it's a fairly straightforward process. Once you get to this point, you just kind of turn the crank on it. All right, questions about that? All right. Um, and, and usually if, I th I'm not sure that it says this in problem five, but the target is that the Q or that the, the power factor would be 0.95 lagging. 
you, you don't typically, I, I don't push it over the edge and make it start going leading. All right. That just means I'm putting a bigger capacitor in than I need to. Okay. Questions? Oh. No. Okay. All right. All right. Then what I want to do is I want to start my main topic for today, which is three phase. Okay. <clears throat> what three phase means, I'm gonna try to get to the point of it a little bit later on, but I won't, I'll jump ahead here for a second. So this is what wiring would look like in a typical uh, building, right? Um, and that wiring scheme is pretty pretty typical um, for what you might have. Um, it's actually not the, the the coloring. I don't maybe I don't like the coloring. Typically, the neutral wire, the end wire, is white. All right, neutral is a term that I'll just to define a couple of things that that electricians will often say. These three wires. What, what do you call those three wires? Hot wires. Yeah, these are hot. All right. This guy here is the neutral. He's a return wire. He is grounded somewhere. So he's basically close to zero volts, not necessarily. Um, something wild you can do if you stick a multimeter into the neutral on that outlet, you'll probably see that it's actually about 10 volts. All right. So, and it's, don't want to get into the details of that before I fry your brain on stuff you don't need to know yet, but it's, it should be close to zero. Okay. Now, if, if you notice this, what they try to do here is I've got, in this case, I've got one, two, three single phase loads, okay? And I've got one three phase load. And that's what you would see in a building like Epic here, right? So in Epic, you would see that we have fans. Um, and I just, so when I say fans, not this little dinky thing, but this guy here, right? There's a hundred horsepower motor or something or several hundred horsepower motors somewhere in this building that are three phase for sure. All right. And that motors are always quote unquote balanced loads. Right. Now, what do you notice about, about these three single phase loads and how they're connected? They all have the neutral wire and they only go. So if you notice one of them goes to the red, one of them goes to the yellow, one of them goes to the blue. When, when somebody designs a building, electrical engineer designs a building, he tries to quote unquote balance the loads. Right. He tries to assume that a third of the load is going to be on one phase, a third is going to be on the other, and a third is going to be on the other. And obviously that's not going to happen, right? But it's going to be close to that, right? If you look at like that outlet back there, it's probably on A phase, and, and there's probably a set over here that's on B phase, right? And so it's going to be kind of balanced around because you can only guess where people are going to plug stuff in. But but that's the way we, we tend to try to design things. Now, we got to talk about why we do three phase, because as we get into the semester, as we get into the later parts of the semester, we start talking about three phase motors, right? How motors work. Most of the motors that you see in the real world are, world are three phase, right? Basically what it means, and we'll, we'll do, as we start to get into more of the electromagnetic stuff, which will be next week, I'm going to start to do more demonstrations in here where I show you some, some real stuff. If I look at a three phase motor, basically what happens in a three phase motor, a three phase generator, the windings on that motor, there's one winding that's going to be here, one that's going to be here, and one that's going to be here. They're going to be 120 degrees offset from each other. And Tesla figured out that if you do that, you can make a lot of things be nice about the world, right? And so that's basically why we do three phase, is you can simplify a lot of things if you set up a set of windings and a motor that way, All right? So let's see a little bit about why, All right? So this is what we have. If I look at the output of a generator, this is what you get at the output of a generator. You get four wires coming out like this. And you basically have three voltage sources inside of that generator. And we're going to figure out, we're going to develop the model of that at some point for a generator, for a synchronous generator, which is what the world runs on. We're going to develop that model and figure those out. But here is what I would have for what those look like. If I looked, them on, looked at them on an oscilloscope, they would look like this. And notice the peak values I wrote here is 120 times square root of two. But my phasers I wrote as 120 because I wrote those in RMS. Okay. Now I want you guys to tell me the red, the blue, and the green. All right. So I labeled this basically over 360 degrees. 
which in time, this would be, if I'm talking 60 hertz, this would be a period, right? One over 60, okay? Which one of these is A phase, B phase, and C phase? Let's start with A. Which one is A phase? The blue, all right? This guy here is A phase, and I've written it as V A N. All right, because this wire here, N, is my neutral. All right. What neutral's job in life is, is what? Why does neutral why does N exist? Well, it's a it's a return wire. And, and it is so it's reference to ground. So there would be somewhere a, a connection to earth ground there. But the neutral is a return wire. When I say return wire, what I mean is the current comes out here, goes out to the world, does its stuff, and then it comes back. And it comes back through the end line, the, the return line. Okay. So, all right. Um, the way I write these is VAN, VBN, VCN, which means the voltage between A and neutral the voltage between B and neutral and the voltage between C and neutral. And if I do KVL here, you'll see that this, the voltage between here and here is VAN, right? And so on and so forth. So VAN is, if I wrote that guy as a time domain waveform, how would I write that? As a time domain waveform, in other words, as a cosine waveform. Well, 120 times the square root of two, yeah, times cosine of whatever my frequency is. So I'll say omega t, which which would be two pi sixty if I'm talking sixty hertz. Does he have a phase shift? No. All right. Now, which one is the next one? The red. All right. What's the phase I give to that guy? Well, he peaks 120 degrees later. So I always look at the relationships between the peaks. He peaks 120 degrees later. So if he peaks later, it's what? It's, it's lagging, which means I had to pull the blue one basically to the right to make it happen. So if it's lagging, I had to pull it to the right. That means that if I write this, it's 120 root T or root two cosine Mega T, and then what do I say? Minus 120 or plus 120? It's minus 120. When it's lagging like this, if I shifted it to the right, it's minus 120. Okay. Now, what about C? This guy's VBN. This is VCN. How do I write him? Minus 240, all right, yeah, minus 240. Now, it turns out if I were to look at this, I don't wanna get into trig tricks, right? But if I, if I looked at the negative period over on this side, I would see that if I took the blue and shifted it to the left 120 degrees, that's the shame as shifting to the right 240 degrees. So sometimes you see this as 120, root two cosine omega t plus 120, all right? I usually don't do it that way. I don't, I don't like to play the trig tricks too much. It's zero minus 120 and minus 240, all right? So for these guys, if I write their phasers out, they basically look like this. Here's VAN, where's VBN? Where is that going to be? Third quadrant, yeah. Over here. Now, why there? Not so. So the VC ends over here. Why is why is VBN over in the third and VCN in the second? Because the negative. Because basically, the way I think about it is, I had to push this guy back minus one twenty. Right back is always so negative angles are if I go in the clockwise direction, right? Positive angles are if I go in the in the counterclockwise. This here would be minus two forty, right? 
All right. So those, those are our relationships. Now, technically that V A N does not have to have an angle of zero it could have an angle of 10 degrees, but what has to be true is that those, those three things, those three phasers have those 120 degree relationships like we're talking about. All right. So the other thing that we talk about, and we talk about it more commonly is what we call line to line voltages. All right. The voltages between the wires. So what I can say is that there is a VAB, right? So which is between A wire and B wire. There's a VBC, let's put it this way, VBC. And again, I, I always do these underlines here to designate that I'm talking about a vector. The other guy is VCA like that all right the voltages between those now if i if i do so in other words the way i define it vab is van minus vbn vbc is vbn minus vcn and vca is vcn minus van Okay, so typically we think of it like this. Here's VAN, here's VBN, here's VCN. If I was more rigorous, I'd probably, I'd try to derive, okay, well, what's that do, right? And and I'd work that out. So in other words, if I, if I put in here, if I put these into Cartesian coordinates and I, I would do some adjustment of those what would i find about the magnitudes of these things and the angles of these things where is vab or let me ask you this way you may not remember the specifics but hopefully you remember this what happens to their magnitude and their angle let's say it this way what happens to their magnitude multiply by root three all right so each of these guys is root three times whatever, I'm gonna write it this way, times V, where V is the magnitude of VAN, and they all have the same magnitude, okay? And I'm gonna say for a minute, let's say this guy has an angle phi. In other words, he's not necessarily a cosine, he's just got an angle of phi, okay? Um, oh, sorry, let me do this way. Let me say V A N is V with an angle of phi. Okay. Where is so all three of them are going to be bigger? Okay. All three of them are going to be bigger. What's true about their angles? Where do they sit? Any idea? They're all gonna be 120 degrees apart from each other. That's not gonna change, okay. Any idea where they sit? Anybody remember? Yeah, they basically each, they're, they're, they shift ahead by 30 degrees. So this is VAB. He shifts ahead, this is 30. He's 30 ahead of that guy. This guy shifts 30 ahead. And then another one shifts 30 ahead. So this is VBC. And I'm not going to try that. V, and this is VCA. Okay. Um, so this guy has an angle of, I did not probably give myself enough room. Don't worry about writing this down. I know you guys like to write stuff down, but there's a summary of all of this, right? Um, what do I do if it's five plus 30, the way that, the way that I write this, um, this guy is at minus. So if the angle of VAN is at five minus 90 degrees, or is it, is it five? This guy is at five minus 90 and this guy is going to be at five plus 150. 
All right. So in other words, this guy here has an angle of 150. This guy here has an angle of minus 90. All right. Now, I'm not going to get too lost in, in the way that I wrote those angles. The thing I'll say about this is what do I notice? Once I know the angle of one of them, right? Which I, in my case, I always find the angle of VAB first. What do I do if I need to find the angle of VBC and VCA? If I know the angle of VAB, how would I get the angle of the other two? Subtract 120 and then subtract 240. Okay. And then I'll always have it. Okay. So we're gonna do an example of that here in a little bit. All right. So let's get into, first of all, the three phase circuit. All right. And just try to understand this. This is a, our basic three phase circuit. We always, always start with. Um, and actually, before I do that, one thing I'll just say real quick is some of you guys may have heard how many. So how many volts are coming out of an outlet in this room? 120. That's an RMS number. OK. So have you ever heard 120 slash 208? All right, 120, 208 is a common voltage. What's 120 times the square root of three? It's 208, okay. Um, those lights here are probably 277. If I take 277 times the square root of three, that's 480. So some of you guys have probably heard of 480 volts. So, so sometimes you'll see, particularly for low voltage stuff like that, 120, 208, um, 277, 480. I say those are low voltages. Those those are low voltages that you would have in distribution in a building like this. Like Epic probably gets a 480, 277 service. And then there's some transformers that take it down to 120, 208. All right, for the plug loads and stuff. All right, so I, anyway, it's useful to, to know that, right? Um, that, that, that that exists. All right, so this is this is my typical setup here that I would have. What I have is three circuits. VAN, VBN, VCN. This is this is the way basically the whole grid is set up. Right? Is I have a setup like this. And what I have, or at least the way I want the grid to be set up, notice that the impedance in each of those is the same. Okay. This is what I would call a balanced load. Balanced three-phase load. Because each line has the same impedance. Oftentimes they they don't have the same impedance. We try to get them to be similar, but they're not exactly that way. If you really get into power, if you take power systems one and you start going into, into you know, the workforce on this stuff, usually you don't talk about the impedance of your loads. You actually say my load is this many kilowatts and this many kilobars, which you can relate to an impedance if you have to, but we typically refer to our loads in terms of P's and Q's. All right, anyway. This is a balanced three-phase setup. So we're gonna, we're gonna say is I wanna solve for in this particular system, um, I wanna solve for IA, IB, and IC. I'm gonna look what, the, what was the number that I chose here in my example. I think, what's my impedance? Yeah, okay. My, my ZY here is going to be 10 plus J10. Okay. So what kind of load is that? 10 plus J10. Is that inductive or capacitive? Inductive. Because it's got a it's got a positive imaginary part, positive angle. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm going to say that VAN, VBN, VCN, I don't know, they're just going to be normal sort of stuff they're going to be um let's say it's 120 uh angles zero degrees and the vbn vcn but all flow from there okay all right let's say i wanted to solve for the currents and that's what i want to do i want to figure out what ia ib and ic are okay so how should i start this problem how should i do this Well, it, it, yeah, my chances are, you know, so I know the way you guys get through through network, right? It would be like, I'm a mesh guy or I'm a, I'm a nodal guy or whatever. So, so this is a mesh guy's dream, right? It's, he's got four meshes here to deal with, right? But Moose is right. I don't actually have to look at each one 
Um, do, so what, what I want to do is I want to do basically for this um, superposition. Okay. Right. So in other words, I could turn on VAN, turn off VBN and turn off VCN. So if I did that, if I turned on VAN, turned off VBN, turned off VCN, right? Where would all the current be going? So let's let's just let's just work that out for a second. Here's V, here's VAN, here's ZY. All right. So if I turned off all of the other sources, I'd have a bunch of ZYs. And I'd have Mr. N there. Where's all the current IA going to go? Through the neutral. All, right. all the current's going to go that way. None of it's going to go through here or through here. So basically, that circuit simplified itself down pretty quick, didn't it? To that. It doesn't, if I want to solve for IA, it doesn't get any simpler than that, does it? Right? I have one impedance, one source. It's Ohm's law to solve it, right? So I have, all right, IA is equal to VAN divided by ZY, all right? So just looking at that for a second. Here's, so, right, IA is VAN divided by that ZY. Pretty simple, okay? Now, should I put it? All right, so if I want to figure out what the other currents are, all right, so IB, IC, what are they going to be? ACS. Well, to figure out, um, so far I only know one. I got to keep doing superposition, right? If, if I want to get the neutral current, then yes, I would do KCL, which I'm going to want to do, right? But for now, I want to get IB and IC. How do I get those? Same exact process. Well, they're going to be similar to each other, right? So I'm going to get IA is this. I'm going to get IB. If I go through that process, it the circuit looks the same. So you're right. It's the same impedance here. What's the voltage in that setup? VBN. Yeah, VBN. And IC would be what? Yeah, VCN. Yep, divide by the same impedance. So... If I look at this here, all right, so if I want to solve for this guy, I got I got one vector divided by another vector. So this is a this is a vector problem, right? So I'm gonna do this in polar form. How do I figure out the magnitude of this result here? How do I figure out the magnitude of that result? Magnitude Yeah, magnitude of V A N. Oops, and I want to be careful. I am not trying to call that a capital. Divided by the magnitude of ZY. And then how? what's the angle of it? Yep, angle of VAN, which I called phi. All right, minus the angle of Z. Okay. And the same is going to be true for all three of them, right? So I'm going to get... If I write this guy out, basically works out to be what I just wrote out here. Okay. So <clears throat> what's true about the magnitudes of all three of those currents? They're all the same. All right. Their magnitudes are the same. What I did here is I sketched out where are they? I didn't put I didn't put a number in for the voltage, but you could assume it's 120, I guess, right? If I did that, so Maybe I should have blocked these out so you couldn't see it. Eh, so it's I, I can't do that now, right? Where is IA? IA is related to VAN. So I look at this guy, right? If I try to relate IA to VAN, here's IA down here. Now for the for the impedance that I had, right? If my impedance ZY is ten plus J ten. His magnitude is the square root of 200. What's his angle? Well, his angle is going to be 45 degrees, right? Positive 45 degrees. And I don't do any work on that one because 10 plus J10, I know that's going to point off to 45 degrees. 
All right. So why did I put my current down here at 45? Why, or sorry, I said that's 45 degrees right here, but this guy's really, if I ask you what's the angle of IA, what's the angle of IA? Not 45 degrees, but negative 45 because I subtract the angle of the impedance. He's lagging because he's a inductive type of load. Okay, so if I look at my currents, right? Relative to each other, what's true about the currents relative to each other? They're all they're all the same size, right? What about their angles relative to each other? So IA to IB to IC. They're all 120 apart, yeah, and they're all 45 degrees away from their, their buddy voltage, all right? They're all lagging their voltage by 45 degrees. All right, so... All right, so I figured out what all those are. The question would be, what then is this current? Because we basically just found out that all of those currents, right? If this was, if this is IA, this is IB, and this is IC, all of those currents are basically going into the neutral wire, right? So superposition tells me that IN has to be IA plus IB plus IC. All right, now, this gets into the beautiful part about three phase, right? Is if I have a set of what I call a balanced three phase set, all right? In other words, if, if I have a set of vectors that have the same magnitude and their angles, it doesn't, doesn't matter their voltages or currents, doesn't matter what they are. If they're all like this, where they have the same magnitude and they're separated by 120 degrees, if I add those up, their sum is zero, okay? That's true for these guys. Wasn't that also true for these three currents? Yes, okay? So it's as if that neutral wire didn't exist, right? In other words, this circuit here is the same as a circuit that would look like this, right? So I have the three loads and the three sources. Like that. Okay. So I didn't need the neutral wire because the current's all summed to zero in that neutral wire. Right. So if you think about it, if I built this, this is one of the reasons this is one of the reasons now why three phase is useful, right? If I think about it, I would have I could have built three circuits, three single phase circuits like this, completely disconnected from each other. How many wires does it take to build that circuit? Six. How many wires does it take to build this circuit? Three. All right. So in other words, from the perspective of, I see where you can say five, right? It looks like five sort of, like if I look at this from the perspective of, if this was a, this is the power grid. In other words, looking into the wall outlet, Duke basically has three wires coming out. Going into a motor, you have three wires coming in. I basically cut down the amount of copper in half. You know anything about the price of copper? It's pretty expensive, right? So um, this this is a pretty significant savings potential if I did that. Now, it doesn't quite work that way in the field. There's always some amount of imbalance between the loads, and so there has to be some neutral, but it can be smaller than the other wires typically. All right. So it there's there's a there's at least two reasons. There's probably more why we use three phase. The the basic one here is what we just said. Half the copper is needed what it comes down to right so it's a heck of a lot cheaper right um so basically we use three-fourths of the of the wiring that would be required right um three i guess three-fourths from the perspective of this picture but if i think of it as three single phase circuits it's half okay um now the other reason which I won't get get into later but we saw this whole thing about p of t for a single phase p of t the instantaneous power which we don't talk about a lot 
We said the power into a light bulb looks like that. It's got an average value plus this sort of sine wave. We don't talk about it. We only talk about P, the average value of it. Cool thing is technically P of T is the same thing here. So P of T is whatever is the phase A power plus whatever the, the B phase power is plus whatever the C phase power is. It turns out that works out to be just simply three times the average power in any one of them, all right? As long as your loads are balanced. So in other words, there, you don't have this behavior. That's nice for a motor. If a motor, motors don't like having this, this power, that it, it, it causes all sorts of bad things, all sorts of weird torques and causes motors and bearings to fail. All right, so, so this is one of the two reasons why we use three phase a lot, okay? Um, so, so with that, basically, you know, it kind of comes down to, all right, well, this stuff is, is pretty common, right? Um, any kind of building is sort of set up this way. And typically what we do is we say we have two types of ways that we can think about our loads. In the homework, the last problem in the homework, you have one three phase problem on the homework. You'll have more for the next one, right? Um, you have Y type loads and you have delta type loads, okay? They call them delta because when you put them together, they look like a triangle, like a delta. And we put them together here, they look like a, the letter Y, all right? Um, if you have a balanced load like a motor, you can think of it however you want. In other words, from the perspective of the terminals, this is like a Thevenin sort of thing, right? In other words, these two circuits are equivalent to each other from their terminals, right? IA, IB, and IC. So this current, this current, and this current. Here, let me write it this way. IA here and IA here are equal to each other, all right? That's the important thing. So, And, and some loads, sometimes we think of loads Y, sometimes we think of them as delta, okay? All right, if that's true, there's a there's an ugly transformation to go between delta and y. I think they teach you that in circuits one, maybe. Um, but if I I don't really care about it if it's unbalanced. Basically, it's this: if if I have three circuits, y and delta, basically if they're balanced, so z y here, z delta here, z delta is three times z y is what it what it kind of comes down to, right? And so I can always make the relationships for them. So the you know what's what are the what are the professor tricks you know that we do well the professor tricks that we do is to basically give you well sometimes we'll give you a source that's delta sometimes we'll give you y and sometimes we'll give you delta on the load side and so you just got to figure out how to solve the problem all right what we always do with these problems is we take it back to y sources and y loads okay that's basically our our approach to solving so we're going to do an example here but here's the summary, all right? Um, basically like this, I so VAN, VBN, VCN, and how does IA and, and VA, um, or IA, IB, and IC all relate to each other? One thing about this, right, is, is if I looked at my load, if, if I had a ZY, right, the angle of ZY would be phi, B minus phi I, right? That's always going to be true, all right? Um, and I usually have like this, this is our relationship. We have so source and load. I can think of them as kind of black boxes. And then I have a, a set of lines between them. Um, and then I, I put in here um, two terms that are used a lot. I, I try not to focus on these too much. Line voltage is the voltage between two phases. So like between phase A and phase B. Right, and then we talk about phase voltage, which is the line to neutral voltage. I usually don't try to worry too much about that. In the real world, we usually talk in terms of line voltages, the line to line value the most, right? So 480 is a term you've heard. You might've heard 4160 or 4.16 kV or 13.8 kV. All those numbers are the line voltage. All right, they're the, they're the value of a VAB. Okay, those those are the, the numbers most commonly used. Now, the other thing you'll see this in, in my problem uh, on the homework, but we usually use lowercase subscripts on the source side and uppercase subscripts on the load side. 
All right, and and my problems are set up with that that terminology. All right, so I I listed here some of the common um, voltages that you might see. So the the first two there, um, that's what you see in a commercial building. So I wrote C and I. That's what utilities would call commercial industrial. What's the other What's the other segment? If you're a utility, there's three segments that you have. Is it commercial and industrial? C and I is one. What's the other one? R. Yeah, residential. Commercial and industrial, fairly similar to each other, and residential is its own beast uh, entirely. Um, and then I wrote here power distribution systems. That's what you would see like on the overhead wooden poles out going down the road, right? Duke, most things you see in Duke are that are 23 kV system throughout throughout this grid all right it can be different in different places but that's the most common thing around these parts all right so anyway useful to know that what i what i was saying though my my basic approach to these problems is going to be basically these steps get everything into a y connected circuit use superposition that same concept and analyze the a phase circuit and then once i've analyzed the a phase circuit I just use that balanced three phase set relationship to figure out how I solve all the other ones. Okay, that's a basic, basic approach. All right, so, all right, I went nasty on this one, right? This is a delta and a delta. So it's got a fair bit of work for me to do here, right? So what do I do for this guy to solve? How do I approach this? The first thing I'm going to do is I, I want to look at this as it's pretty similar to this picture here, right? So in this picture, I got a source on one side and a load on the other side, and I got some lines between them, okay? So where's the lines here between the source and the load? Between the lowercase a or the lowercase double case letters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is one line here. This is one line here, and this is one line here. So I can I can think of this guy as if I wanted to. It's helpful to probably look at it, the picture this way. Because again, this is the way as you get more into the into the practical applications of electrical engineering, we don't start thinking of everything as just impedances all over the place. Right? We often say, okay, here's a load. Here's a source. Here's a little a, little b, little c, capital A, capital B, capital C, right? And then I have this line impedance here, which is 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 ohms, like that. Now, oftentimes you're going to see, again, when I'm doing power-related stuff, I usually don't say that this is an L Right. What I what I usually do is I write J omega L. And I'll try to be clear about this, but usually what that means with your omega is it's two pi sixty. So I just tell you what's the value of the impedance rather than what's the inductance. Okay, it's pretty common to do it that way with power stuff. All right. So I said the first step here was to try to figure out how to get this guy into a Y connected circuit. Now, how are my loads and my sources connected in this case? Both my load and my source are what? They're what? Are they, do I have Y? So let's look at the source for a second. Is the source Y or delta? What's that? Delta, right? So I basically see, I don't even have an N there. All right, so I want to start out and I just want to, it, uh, relate these two things. So, um, so I want to make my Y circuit. So let's start out with, well, what am I given about my sources? So VAB, VBC, and VCA. Okay. Which one's VAB? Yeah, 215, negative 10. 215, negative 10. Now, without, without even looking, I'm not going to, I mean, you look at the picture all you want. I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to say this is 215, and this is 215. 
And without looking at, I don't know what it says over there, but I'm going to say it's negative 130. Am I right? Yes. All right. What's this one? I'm going to say it's negative 250. Am I right? It says they did, they did 110, right? So 110 and negative 250 would be the same angle, right? And it's not, not too hard to see that, right? If you, if you drew out the complex plane, you'd see that. How did I do that? Yeah, because I know they're all 120 apart, right? So, so if I want to get to the Y circuit, I got to convert this to VAN, VBN, and VCN, right? So, all right. So over here, I want to write VAN, VBN, and VCN. How do I do that? Let's, let's do the magnitudes first. What do we know about the magnitudes? If we're not sure we can go back to, you know, to this, all this good stuff over here, but I don't want to. Divide by the square root of three. So this becomes 215 divided by root three, whatever good number that is. Okay. And I want to figure out their angles. All right, so VAB to VAN. So for this, I go back to my, my guide here. So I said if VAN has an angle of V, VAB has an angle of V plus 30. All right, which angle was I given here in this problem? Which angle did they give me? Well, they gave me the angle of VAB, All right? So how do I get the angle of VAN? So I know, I know this guy. I want to get this guy. What do I do? Subtract 30. Yeah, go back 30, right? So this guy would become what? Negative 40. And without, you know, I could do some other stuff from those things. But the way I look at this is I say, well, how do I get from VAN to VBN? Well, I would say I'd subtract 120 from the first one, right? So this becomes negative... 160, and this guy becomes negative 280, like that, all right? But, and I could relate that to positive angles if I wanted to, right? But that's that's kind of my basic approach for thinking about it. Now, that's the first part of getting the Y circuit. So basically what I have now um, is, when I say get the Y circuit, basically what I'm saying is, is I want to turn this into a situation where I have this, right? And so we did the first part and I guess I should be careful here because I don't have just empty wires, I'm saying I got a line impedance of some kind. And then I've got these ZY. Like that. We did the first part. We got the VANs, VBN and VCN. You got to get the ZYs. How do I get the ZYs from this guy? Yeah, basically this this here is my Z delta, right? This is a Z delta. This is a Z delta. The legs, each each of those legs of the delta has a Z delta. And we said basically Z delta is equal to three times Z Y. Okay. And you can derive that and show that. I'm not going to, right? Z Y is equal to three Z delta. Oh, oh, sorry, Z delta is three Z Y. That means Z Y is equal to what? If I, well, yeah, sure, Z delta divided by three. So what, what's that give me for the numbers I've got there? What would it be? So be three plus J two. Right, so in other words, nine plus J six divided by three. Okay. All right. 
And at that point, back in this picture, I now I know that this is three plus J2, and it's that way in all of them. So now I've gotten myself to the point where I can solve this guy. Okay. And I can solve for this is IA. This here is IB. This here is IC. If we talk about what we usually care about in any real world problem, it's what is IA, IB, and IC? What are the currents in those lines? Almost never do you care about, oh, well, I have a delta connected load, so what's the currents inside that delta? If, if I have a motor, I don't know what the heck it looks like inside, all right? It's a circuit, and uh, we don't know what those currents look like. So we usually just typically think about, as a, as a power engineer or somebody working with the grid, this is the grid, okay? We care about that part. We don't usually care about what's over in here. All right, so I'm going to treat it that way. And I'm not going to worry about the currents inside there. I want to get those currents in those lines. We have now figured out this circuit. So how do I figure out what IA, IB, and IC are? How do I get those? Just do the superposition again, yeah, right? So how do I get, how do I solve this guy to do this? How do I solve that circuit? How do I figure out IA given what I've written right there? It's just Ohm's law. Yeah, it's just the voltage source divided by the impedance. Yeah, it's that simple. Right. So it basically works out to be so this is the circuit that I get. Right. Um, and I end up with IA equals VAN divided by 0 0.05 plus. J 0 0.1 plus whatever the impedance on the Y circuit was, ZY. And I solve it from there. Okay. Now I drew a I drew a plot here of how VAB, VAN, all those relate to each other. Okay. And you can look at that later. And I put some code in there too to, to show how I wrote those. And I'm going to come back to that code for a second. So I just solved my single phase circuit. All right. I just said IA equals VAN divided by 0 0.05 plus J 0 0.1 plus three plus J two, like that. All right, so I, I solve for that. I get a number when I do that. And the number that I get, if I go through that, is gonna be what? Maybe some of you guys have already figured it out. Um, the number I get when I do that works out to be 33.5212 amps with an angle of negative 74, oops, okay, negative 74.5484 degrees, okay? <clears throat> All right, now, let's say I want to figure out IB I see, how do I do that? How do I figure out those? Should I solve the circuits? I could do that. Do I have to solve the circuits? No, just subtract 120, right? So basically I have IA. So IA was 33, what did I say it was? 33.5212 amps with an angle of negative 74.5484. So IB and IC are what? What's their magnitudes? Same, yeah, 5212 amps, be the same for that guy. What about the angles here? Track 120, right? So this becomes negative 194.5484. What's this guy become? Negative 314.5484 degrees. Okay. Now, then I, I ask, well, figure out the line and phase voltages for me. All right. 
In other words, I want to figure out what is the an, and I want to figure out what is v a b. So, what do the capitals mean? The load side stuff. Yeah. So, I want to figure out what those are, right? So, <clears throat> how do I get that? Well, let's go to the circuit. We had v a n with little subscript. And then we had these impedances 0 0.05, J 0 0.1. And then we had our ZY right here. V, one of those two voltages is in this circuit, right? VAN, VAB with capitals. Which one? Yep. So V capital AN is here. So if I said to you, how do I solve for that? Well, you already know the current. So if I know the current, I can take the current times ZY, right? Or I could say it's a voltage divider. There's a couple of ways to do it, but I know that this will be, if this current here is IA, right? This guy is IA times ZY, like that. So if I go through that process, this guy's gonna work out to be 120, point eight six two four with an angle of negative forty point eight five eight three degrees. Now let's say I asked you to find VBN and VCN. How would I find those? Shift in 120. Okay. Let's say I asked you to find VAB. How would you find that? Well, I could take VA and subtract VBN, right? But I, I can say also it's square root of three times 120.8624. And what would his angle be? Plus 30, yes, that would be negative 10.8583 degrees, right? That's the basic process. <clears throat> All right, now, um, so there's, I've got, and if you go, if you go through the notes, I have this all worked out. So the notes section, you can see those are the same numbers um, and you'll, you'll get those. I want to talk real quick. The, the problem six basically does there's something very similar. And in fact, I think problem six, it's just, a, it's, it looks like this. It's a Y, um, Y, Y circuit. If I have this set up, and again, I just want to show this picture here for a second. This is what you would typically have if you're talking about. So I just took an example from a from a diagram of how you would connect a motor up. Um, so I have a 480 volt motor. So that's a what kind of voltage is 480 typically? What's com yeah commercial industrial? And it's it's a line to line voltage, right? So that would be the VAB, or written here L1 L2, okay. We're talking, this is going to be the first electric machine we start talking about next week, a relay or a contactor. Okay. So um, that's, that's an electric machine. We're not going to deal with it. Basically, it's just, it's something that closes down. Okay. And then breaks and closes down and breaks. But the way I would typically think about that motor is like this, like the load, this motor is basically a balanced load that can be thought of as connected like that. Okay. And, you know, so I've got this arrangement where I've got those voltages. If I ask you for what's the complex power into that thing, and you didn't know anything about three phase, if I said to you, what's the complex power into that load S, what would it be? So let me ask this, for a single phase load, if I had a, if I had a single phase load and I knew its voltage and its current, what's its complex power? V, v, well, it's V times I, V times I conjugate, right? So it's V A N times I A conjugate, all right? Plus V B N I B conjugate plus V C N I C conjugate, right? And if, if you go into, 
I think problem six on the homework, that would solve it. I think what I ask you for is what's the loads P and Q? So if you took the real part of this result and the imaginary part of this result, you'd get the P and Q, okay? If I, if I look at this guy carefully, again, and I have this in the notes, I kind of derive it out a little bit, but it, what's this work out to be? Three times VAN IA conjugate. Basically, three times PA, I guess, if you will, plus J times three QA, where I would write SA equals PA plus JQA equal to VAN times IA conjugate. Like that. Now, uh, that's sufficient for, for all you guys need at this point, right? To be able to finish the homework is that relationship. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. I'm not gonna talk too much more about, about three phase power. Basically the notes got the summary, right? That's the key summary there. And we'll look at an example like this. You'll have a problem or two like this on the next homework, homework two, not homework one, where you think of it from a load perspective. But again, this is the way we typically think about it. It's I got loads and I got a source, okay? All right, so let me 